We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Activities involving the lighting and use of fires separate hominins from other primates. Indeed, many of the innovations attributed to early humans were dependent on pyrotechnology. In a hunter-gatherer context, fire is mostly associated with domestic uses, such as cooking, heating, social interactions, and protection from predators. Importantly, though, Fire enables some technical tasks, and products like ash were exploited in, ver in a variety of ways from at least 300,000 years ago. Fire gave humans the edge over other primates. Where and when did this begin? Fire simply obtained from burning branches or coals originating in wildfires must first be distinguished from fire started from dry wood, tinder, and some means of making sparks for ignition. More than a million years ago, fire seems to have been obtained expediently from natural sources and then used briefly at sites like Kubifora in East Africa and Vondervak and Swartkrantz in South Africa. The ephemeral burned layers in Vondervak are in a dark area about 30 meters from the cave entrance. All the evidence suggests that this fire was transported from a natural source, such as a lightning strike that set the grassland alight. It was then used in the cave, but the fire could not be curated and maintained for long. Certainly Homo erectus, the likely occupant of this cave, seems not to have been able to make fire from scratch, and probably collected it from wildfires. Nonetheless, we know that Homo erectus had an enriched diet compared with earlier hominins because relative to them, Homo erectus had large brains but small teeth and guts. This physique may have come about through increased meat consumption when hunting became efficient. The occasional cooking of food may have contributed to the new brain-gut ratio. Perhaps this is so, but we don't have firm evidence yet. Habitual use of fire is suggested by the central placement of a hearth in the late Lower Paleolithic site, Kesem Cave, Israel, somewhere between 420 and 200,000 years ago, before the arrival of anatomically modern humans. Not only were Kesem hominins cooking on fire, but based on artifact use traces and botanical remains, they seem to have used ash as a preservative for various foods and perhaps also for hide preparation. It appears that hominins were able to make fire at will by this time. Early Homo sapiens fossils date from about 300,000 years ago at Jebel Erhot in North Africa 
and slightly after this at Florisbud in South Africa. The start of the African Middle Stone Age coincides roughly with the appearance of Homo sapiens. By 177,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was found at Mislia Cave in Israel, suggesting that the earliest Homo sapiens migrations out of Africa may have begun 200,000 years ago. By that time, fire was a regular part of human technology. Kesem is not the only example of early exploitation of the byproducts of fire. By 227,000 years ago, at Border Cave, South Africa, modern humans put ash to good use, as I shall shortly explain. Border Cave is large and it was extensively excavated in the last century. The present excavations sample small areas exposed by previous archaeologists. Here, in the 227,000-year-old member, five white ash, there are several superimposed ashy layers, implying repeated use of fire and probably the ability to make it at will. There are also ephemeral traces of silicified grass, the grass is essentially fossilized. In slightly younger members, we found burned rhizomes, presumably from using fire for cooking, and I shall discuss this shortly. The plant material from the early bedding was studied using a scanning electron microscope, as well as phytolith analysis, both methods revealed anatomical features like leaf blade structures and bilobate short cells, prickles and stomata. These identify the border cave plant fragments as grass from the Panacoidae subfamily. Panicum maximum still grows prolifically outside the cave. Although the oldest bedding is ephemeral now, it may once have looked like better preserved grass bedding in some of the younger occupations. Within the Stone Age sequence of Border Cave, people often placed grass on ash. Occasionally this ash was derived from older grass bedding that may have been burned to clean the site, but sometimes grass was placed on raked wood ash. Chemical analysis of sediments can identify ash, and sometimes its origin can be distinguished. At Border Cave, Marine Wajisa conducted on-site FTIR analyses, and we could therefore be certain that ash was indeed used underneath grass bedding. Ash provides a clean, dry, insulating surface, but ethnographies report further that ash repels crawling insects and various parasites. Ash supposedly blocks their breathing and biting apparatus and dehydrates them. The two images at the top of the screen show how the grass bedding may have been made. The two images below this show how we experimented with 30 brown ticks placing them in a circle of ash within a sealed container. Those ticks that breached the ash wall were smothered in the powder and moved with difficulty. Ash may thus have some efficacy in preventing bites from parasites that endanger people's health. Border cave people seem to have employed several techniques for keeping pests away. Sandra Lennox used the wood anatomy of charcoal found on the 227,000-year-old bedding to identify the camphor bush Tarkananthus. The smoke from this aromatic species is used by modern rural communities to repel insects. Maasai herdsmen in East Africa still make bedding from Tarkananthus leaves and also burn its wood. We found more than 60 charred rhizomes of underground plants in border cave occupations, 
dating between 170 and 120,000 years ago. Some rhizomes were presumably buried and lost while being roasted in hot ash. They were all from the same species, and their morphology matched that of a small hypoxis. Cooking makes food more digestible and easier to chew than when raw. It facilitates peeling rhizomes, and it enhances the glucose availability of starchy plants. Hypoxis was identified largely from the anatomy of the rhizome. We found raphides, which are calcium oxalate crystals, and xylem vessels, particularly useful for identifying the rhizomes. People dug the rhizomes in the field, then transported them and firewood along the steep cliff back to the cave. They could easily have prepared and eaten the rhizomes where they were unearthed, but they did not. The cooking of rhizomes in the cave was a planned activity, with the reward deliberately delayed, presumably in order to share the food at the home base. The process tells us something about the social practices and the cognitive attributes of these early humans. At Classy's River in the Southern Cape, quartzite rocks may have been used to aid cooking because they were reddened by repeated heating in fire. Unidentified underground storage organs were cooked here more than a 100,000 years ago. Other aspects of pyrotechnology are surprisingly early. By 164,000 years ago, people appear to have discovered the transformative power of heating certain siliceous rocks. Careful heating of some rocks and minerals makes them especially suitable for napping. Heat treatment is particularly beneficial for pressure flaking. At Pinnacle Point, Silcrete was heated from the time of the earliest occupations. Heat treatment was also observed at Blombos, where bifacial points were carefully crafted from silcrete. An aspect of pyrotechnology that has absorbed much of my research time has been the production of glue, a single component product, and adhesive, a compound product. The success of manufacturing fixative pastes is dependent on controlled heat, something that can be achieved by understanding the properties of various woods. Raman and EDS spectra revealed hematite and carbon in the adhesive on a Subudu point 72,000 years old. The adhesives on 64,000-year-old tools comprise plant resin and ochre powder compounds. Gas and liquid chromatography identified coniferous resin, while Raman confirmed the presence of hematite. I wanted to know whether the recipes were created with knowledge of the properties of the ingredients. I therefore manufactured some glues and adhesives with and without powdered ochre, and heated them gently to dry them. They were then used to join wooden strips that were later pulled apart by a universal testing machine. Compound adhesive containing a mixture of ochre and gum is stronger than gum alone. This suggests that people knew that ochre was a successful loading agent, and they did not simply choose the ochre for its colour. People at Blombos made ochre-rich paint a hundred thousand years ago, probably by using the same sort of technology demonstrated for adhesive manufacture. Subudu's occupants created a type of tempera paint thousands of years later. As shown in this brief review that favours African examples, Fire technology was already quite well developed before 200,000 years ago. Close to the origin of our species, people could produce fire at will, 
and they used fire, ash, and smoke from medicinal plants to maintain clean, pest-free camps. Modern hunter-gatherer camps have fires as focal points. People regularly sleep alongside them and perform domestic tasks in social contexts. The earliest Homo sapiens groups seem to have behaved similarly. Among the tasks they performed around fires were some fairly sophisticated creations of compound mixtures to enable the assembly of composite tools and weaponry.